Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. And welcome back, everyone. We're talking with somebody today who has has done a lot for his community in terms of education, in terms of healthcare, and so much more. And he's been working on that for years. He is the former business man behind healthcare value management, the president and co-founder outside of Boston. That's just a piece of what he's done. We've made him our Centurion recipient. He's Charles L. Donahue Jr., and he's back with us. Hi, Charles. How are you doing? Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? Good to talk to you. Hey, it's great to have you back on here. And I know that we skimmed healthcare, obviously, in your wheelhouse once before. Last time we got together, we got an email from someone. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, Because I have some concerns. And this is from Jake in Oakland, California. And Jake says, I enjoyed your topic today. I'm genuinely concerned about the healthcare system in our country. I understand that politics are involved. I don't resonate around politics. He goes on to say that it seems that in other countries, including Canada, their healthcare system is one that appears to work. What can be done to improve our healthcare system in this country? Yep. And what are, well, your, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I became very interested in this myself many years ago uh, after I spent uh, two years in the Peace Corps. Uh, and it was a British system in Malaysia. And with the British model of health care uh, in uh, urban and rural parts of a developing country was they really reached out to people and uh, tried to get health everyone into the healthcare system. So if you're in a rural area uh, and you had a local uh, medicine man, uh, they were shown respect. And they were told that they need to get people in for certain types of care and tuberculosis control and all. And I, I really learned how the healthcare system respected everybody. Uh, and uh, when I came back to the United States, I went to graduate school at Cornell. Uh, I was in what was called a health planning pr- training program. The United States decided to get citizens involved in making decisions. What did they want? How did they want them? And I became very interested in learning as much as I could about this idea of citizens becoming involved in healthcare decision making and not just leaving it uh, to the doctors and others. So anyway, I spent a lot of time trying to learn. And one thing that was interesting to me was that uh, the United States, this is back in the, uh, the late 60s, ranked 21st in the world in infant mortality. There were 20 countries had lower infant mortality than the United States, yet we were spending the most money. And I became very curious about what were these other countries doing to have lower infant mortality than the United States and not spending as much money. Uh, and it includes all of basically Europe and Canada. So I was applied for money to go to Europe to meet with some of the people running the health systems in different parts of Europe, particularly on what are they doing about infant mortality. Uh, and I just became very curious about that. Uh, I visited these different countries. I asked them what were they doing that was different from us. Uh, and I went back uh, to Cornell with that information. And the, one of the things that I found out that was a surprising was England did a big study, a call of Great Britain, Scotland, uh, Northern uh, Ireland, uh, everything. And the, the place in England who had highest risk of women, women whose height was not very tall, they had the lowest infant mortality of all of England. And what was unique about that, and I wrote a grant at Cornell, and they gave me money to go for a week, over to up in Northern Scotland, Aberdeen, Scotland. They had the the highest-risk women measured by height, and they found out that the women who were lower in height had higher risk in a developed country. And I, I went over there, and I met with the, the uh, p- professor in Aberdeen, Scotland, uh, and I had a chance to sit down and talk with him. I said, how are you, you got the highest-risk women, and why do you have the lowest infant mortality rate? He said, well, it's easy. We went over to the sociology department, and asked them to help study who these high-risk women were, where were they, where did they live, and help us begin to identify them early in their pregnancy and get them into our teaching center 
for early prenatal care. Maybe make them high priority for early prenatal care. Because what we have found out was if a woman has diabetes, high blood pressure, heart problems, problems with their lungs, they need to come in really early for prenatal care. Because that's why a lot of women die in maternal health, of, of, of maternal deaths, uh, and uh, why a lot of infants die. But the key was to find them early, encourage them to come in, educate them to come in, in whatever language they spoke and whatever culture they were in. When I get back to Cornell, I said, what I'd like to do is do a study of the women who are high risk and where are they coming. And just at that time, Brown University was doing a study where I did my undergraduate work. And they're gathering data on hospital data and physician data that wasn't available to the public or wasn't in the public records, uh, birth certificates and death certificates. So I, I wrote another grant and went down, and Brown University let me access their data that they were gathering. I gathered the data on all these, what I thought were characteristics that you would find in a physician's record, uh, hospital records, uh, like did the woman have diabetes? Did they, she have high blood pressure? What were a lot of these high-risk factors that they found in Scotland? And they let me take those data back to Cornell, and I, Professor Thomas Warren wrote a paper he was a biostatistician. I was not a biostatistician. We wrote a paper on predicting high-risk women. And we just, for, for interest, submitted it to the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, a very prestigious medical journal in obstetrics. And they were fascinated by our article and decided they wanted to publish it. So I had my first published journal, published medical journal article in the journal back when I was in graduate school. Uh, many years later, I was in Boston. I got a telephone call on a Saturday. I was out mowing the lawn. And on the call was a guy who was the, the chief of what today is Brigham and Women's Hospital. In those days, it was Boston Hospital for Women. And the chief I had got to meet of obstetrics, I had met him through some work that I was doing. He said, are you the Charlie Donahue who was up at Cornell? and wrote this article. And I said, well, yeah, I, I wrote an article in a journal back then. He said, well, you know, we, my, my people who worked for me, all the doctors who were, came to me with this article and said, we need to start using this article. It's important. It shows you who are the women we need to find early. And we need to go to the neighborhood health centers and find women no matter what language they speak or what culture that they live in and educate them about how important it is for them to come forward early in prenatal care. And so anyway, they did that, and I got a somewhat of a reputation for having a, an important published article. And I went on to work with physicians in Boston uh, when I was with a consumer group. And our consumer group gathered data and educated doctors. Doctors were aware of what epidemiology was. They weren't taught epidemiology. Epidemiology is understanding data, studying data. What can data tell you? And so as a consumer group, I got to work with some of the top physicians in Massachusetts, the College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, the College of Surgeons, the College of Pediatrics, the Academy of Pediatrics. And I published seven articles with consumers in my organization, writing the articles with physicians to educate physicians about data, not much like we learned about prenatal care, uh, and much like we learned uh, for other types of things. One of the studies we did was we looked at the adequacy of prenatal care. That was if a woman had her first visit to see a doctor in the first trimester and then had at least 10 visits, that was considered adequate, not perfect, but adequate prenatal care. What we then did is we studied that information for five years, every city and town of Massachusetts, in every neighborhood in the city of Boston. And we came back with those data and looked at those data, and what we found out was the rich towns, the rich communities, the rich communities with health insurance had very low, uh, or were, they were very high in adequate prenatal care. 80 to 90 percent of the women had adequate prenatal care. But the poor communities that uh, did not have health insurance, did not have much health insurance, they had adequate prenatal care 
at like 40% instead of 90 to 100%. So a lot of them weren't being seen early, weren't having their diabetes found, weren't having somebody treat their blood pressure, except two or three neighborhoods in Boston who had gone from 40% to 80%. And those neighborhoods were ones that just had something new called a neighborhood health center. Those, those communities set up a board of directors from a housing project. They had treasurers. They hired the doctors. They hired the nurses. When the doctors in the neighborhoods of Boston were dying or retiring, and young doctors wanted to become specialists where they could get paid in the neighborhoods uh, uh, that were rich. So the bottom line was the Boston City Council took that data and began to fund neighborhood health centers. Up until that point, they had not been supporting health centers. But those are just a, quick, a couple of quick points that I learned in my career how valuable data was, how we could educate doctors to work with us uh, in, in upstate New York, uh, one of the groups that was really set the standard for the United States uh, in beginning to look at uh, the whole issue of health planning and neighborhood people getting involved in, in health planning. Uh, and uh, the, uh, upstate New York and the Rochester area used to have a health planning agency called the Finger Lakes Health Planning Agency. And many of us around the country learned a lot from them. And they're still kicking around, still working. They have a new name called Common Ground. And anybody can you know, Google it, look it up, see what they're doing. But it's a combination of citizens, hospitals, doctors, union, government people, and citizens looking at health and health care, how do we improve on it. Uh, and some of the great improvements in the United States have come about by consumer groups getting together, saying what they needed, what they wanted, what kind of health care they wanted. And I'd say the Finger Lakes still exists. The organization I used to run, the Health Planning Council of Greater Boston, was put out of action by a state senator that didn't like some of the ways uh, we were dealing with hospitals mm. and cut our funding, and that health planning disappeared. I went on to another job, setting up my own company. But uh, I think the United States has come a long way, and I think the greatest amount of credit goes to a few people. Uh, in, a, in the previous lecture, I listed some of the, the innovators that I met and taught me a lot and made a big difference in the healthcare system. And one of them was Mitt Romney, the Republican conservative governor of Massachusetts who worked with Ted Kennedy and uh, what the plan they put together for Massachusetts became the affordable healthcare plan that Obama brought in because a Republican and a Democrat agreed on what needed to be done uh, and uh, thanks to Mitt Romney, Mitt was dealing with just conservative ideas. The Heritage Foundation, which is a little different today, came up with the ideas of the Affordable Care Act, what should be a part of it, three basic elements. I could talk about it some future date. But that became a, a national uh, model and has improved the healthcare system in the United States greatly in all but the 12 states who have not adopted Medicaid for everybody. They have refused to do it, although the United States government pays 90% of it. Uh, and these are states also that happen to have, who don't accept Medicaid, the highest maternal death rate in the country and the highest infant mortality rate in the country, in some cases higher than developing countries because they won't accept Medicaid where everybody could get prenatal care and early care. So we have a few glitches in the United States that are political. Uh, there's still glitches uh, where uh, every country in the world, the federal government in every country, including Canada, negotiates with drug companies for discounts. Uh, the Veterans Administration gets a discount from drug companies for like 9 million veterans. Medicaid, or Medicare rather, for our elderly, it's about 70,000 people and until about a year ago received no discounts. Recently, through hard political work on the part of one political party, anybody on Medicare that has diabetes now pays, I think it's $25 a month medication, not $400 a month. But, uh, so we're, we're beginning to go after the money we can save in pharmacy 
at least for Medicare, and solely I think we may do what every other country in the world has done, has given discounts on drugs to everybody. You can go up in northern Vermont and go over to Canada and pay a totally different price for your pharmaceuticals. Why? The Canadian government stepped in and said we're going to get good deals for our citizens, as every other country in the world has done except the United States government. And that is a political party thing uh, where one political party gets a lot of money from the drug companies and has really given a shaft to the the people. So those are just a couple of comments, highlights, uh, but... Uh, we have seen some tremendous progress. We've learned a lot. Uh, we also uh, do some innovative research in this country. Uh, we figured out what COVID was being caused by. We figured out ways of uh, testing the COVID and ways of coming up with pharmaceuticals that would treat it. And so we're, we're very good at research. We're very, very good at uh, advanced uh, um, treatments of complicated illnesses. But the basics, uh, we've come a long way uh, and still have a long way to go, uh, and uh, it's, it's just a matter of staying with it and beginning to educate the political parties that uh, it's not a political issue. Uh, we all should be treated with a first-rate health system, uh, and uh, and that's probably the, the most important uh, goal for all of us, but consumer involvement and in making decisions can make a huge difference. It was destroyed in Massachusetts by a politician, uh, but upstate New York, Rochester area, Finger Lakes uh, is a place to look to for the value uh, with this common ground is the name of the organization. They changed the name from Finger Lakes. It's in Rochester, and anybody wanting to. But whether uh, you need health care in your neighborhood, in your neighborhood in a city, in a rural area, there's a lot of innovative, creative things left to be done. But when you get consumers involved uh, and get educated, uh, they can make a huge difference in healthcare decision making. You we you mentioned at at one point doctors and the number of, and I'm hearing more and more about provider shortages in in our country. Uh, Some projections too, as we go into the next ten years, that there's going to be a a real shortage of qualified medical professionals. Uh, have you heard anything about that, and what are, what are your thoughts? Well, I have honestly not gone into that in great detail on the numbers, but I do know that there's uh, uh, certain uh, parts of the world where, like nurse practitioners uh, 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 and various types of nursing skills are much greater than in the United States. Uh, pregnant women... Uh, have uh, doulas, people come and uh, work with them uh, when they're pregnant. Uh, They may have a different culture or different language. They work with them in the terms of their culture. So there's there's, there's been uh, at least a a lot of publicity uh, for expanding the 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 various areas of nursing. Uh, There's also a a demand to train doctors as family practitioners. We have enough specialists. Just bring somebody that knows how to specialized in, in taking care of the family. There's a lot of discussion about health care for the homeless. A lot of the homeless people were normal people. They became mentally ill. Nobody would live with them. They live in the streets. They live in alleys. 30% of the homeless, uh, homeless uh, women who live together for protection. They have a drug problem. They have a mental ill problem. Uh, and there's people trying to change them. There are people who were once homeless because they're met real and are now working to help a lot of those people. So there's problems on the edges there. Uh, a homeless person can sit down next to you with, and have tuberculosis. We need to find out how do we educate the homeless to participate. And there's some people doing it. There's a book called Rough Sleepers. It's all about the homeless the last 50 years and the creative things that have been done to find them, understand what's driving them. But it's not telling them what to do. It's understanding their, their, their culture, understanding, have empathy. Why do they feel the way they do? In many cases, the homeless have become a part of the solution. They've suggested what we do differently. So there's a lot of edges to the health problem out there. But I think, you know, 
If there's anything, there's a need for family practitioners in medicine. Uh, more nurses as nurse practitioners, doulas who work with pregnant women. Uh, uh, there's a lot of innovation out there that's possible that other countries have discovered that we could do too. So there's, there's a lot of potential innovation out there in healthcare, uh, in the uh, physician-nurse area. Uh, and uh, the creative programs around the country trying these out and suggesting why it makes a difference in a lot of cities, uh, uh, not assessing very well what what's going on in their, their city. Is it Are they advanced? Or are they behind? Uh, the Health Care for the Homeless in Boston is a very advanced program. They've educated other cities on how do you eliminate this problem or cut it back, but you've got to really study it. And somebody's out there experimenting. Uh, what, wh- where are the, uh, the future problems in, around the world uh, as far as healthcare in the rural parts of Africa, Asia, the South America? Uh, is is uh, the next pandemic going to be worse? You know, what, what, uh, how prepared are we? How many people are studying things? Schools of public health are studying many of these issues to prepare us for the future. But it's a uh, as far as doctors and the numbers that we need, I, I'm not an expert on that. And uh, but you know, it's it's certainly in the in the area that needs to be studied. Sure, I I'm amazed. Even decades later, you being involved in the healthcare industry, you still have passion. You still have drive. You still want to make it right. You know, the best best outcome for everybody. What's driving you, Charles? What what's behind you? What's pushing you? Well, what I, what I find interesting, I'm uh, doing work at the Boston University School of Public Health, uh, and they have students from all around the world uh, wanting to work in the public health field. And suddenly doctors, medical people have realized how crucial public health is in, to understand it after COVID and uh, the pandemic that we had. But I think what I find fun is Boston University has in their School of Public Health what they call an activist lab. Uh, it's not just to come to get a master's degree and go work, but it's for kids that want to change things. They're coming in from Asia. They're coming in from Africa. They're coming in from South America. Oh, they're coming from any part of the United States. But they'd like to change the health system where they are. And because I spent most of my life uh, trying to change the health system, uh, and uh, I think I mentioned one time I, the compliment I was once paid by the chief of the Massachusetts um, College of Surgeons, all the surgeons have an organization, and after I got them to work with my consumer group, we're all consumers doing studies, and when we got our first paper published in the journal of the American Medical Association, it was published on surgical variations of surgical rates in Massachusetts, and I was published in their journal, and I went to them, the surgeons in Massachusetts, said, I'd like you to work with us, because we'd like to take these data out to hospitals and out to physician groups. They say, why are these hysterectomy rates so high? Why are these medical back surgery rates so low? Is it a lack of finding people who, who can't walk because their backs are so bad and there's no one diagnosing them? Or is somebody doing too many hysterectomies or too many C-sections? So at first, when we went to them as a, as a consumer group, they, paid, they kind of said, you know, how, who are you? you know, what authority do you have? We said, well, we have our own authority, but we'd like to work with you and get the word out. So to make a long story short, we did work with them and published eight papers in medical journal, pediatrics, obstetrics, surgery. But after five, six years working with them, I got a call, uh, uh, sat, well, actually sat down with the chief of the College of Surgeons in Massachusetts, and he said, i, I got to hand it to you. We, we really thank you for educating us. We never learned in medical school what epidemiology was. And a couple of doctors who do Jack Wenberg at Dartmouth was a famous guy that taught me and a lot of people. But what what you basically did was you came to us and we realized we had no control over you. You're, you're a consumer group, but we don't control. But we decided you were so polite and so nice coming to us. But I, I thank you, and I described the method you used was the velvet fit. We knew you were going to do it anyway. And uh, it reminds me of a a comment uh, from To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, where the, the, the comment is made that uh, what is real courage? And the real courage was described as knowing you're licked 
before you begin. But you go ahead and do it anyway. Mm. And much of what we did, you know, a consumer group going to the College of Surgeons and getting them to work with it. Uh, it helped to have published papers to go to them with, but we, we're going to do it anyway. And uh, so anyway, that was, so when you go to students who are asking you, how did you do the change? What did you do? I've, I've written, just written six papers for the students. How did I make a difference in infant mortality? What did I do? The story I briefly told today. How did I, in Malaysia, work with the tuberculosis control? In a different language, a different culture, uh, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia, the, 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 Indonesia, the largest country in the world that are Muslims. I worked with all the Muslims in Malaysia. They're my dearest friends. Uh, how did we do that? Who did I meet that made impressed me? I wrote a, a, a paper about the people that impressed me, did innovative things that I picked up and ran and used. Uh, what all the jobs I had, what difference did all the jobs make? What was I, my job at the Health Planning Council where we went and did all of the articles? And after working in nonprofit organizations all my life, what was my final job that I set up with a, a friend, co-founder, uh, and we, we made some money that allows me to donate a lot of money nowadays to things. So, But how, that's what the students are interested in. They enjoy it. I enjoy talking to them, you know, and uh, they uh, want to go out and continue changing things. I love to train people, teach people, encourage people who would like to change things and make things better. Sure. It's got to be exciting. After all this time, seeing those changes, yes, sometimes it's a little slower than uh, we want it to be. But uh, appreciate all your, your passion, all your insight on all of this, uh, Charles. Love talking with you. And uh, this is stuff that you know, affects all of us. It really does when it comes to our health care. We want the best for, for all of us and our families. And as you know, for some of you listeners, I'm very also interested in all the innovative, creative things you can do in the educational system. You know, What can you do? getting kids in middle school, up school, people who want to educate people, grandparents, parents, clubs, coaches. There's a lot of opportunity out there, uh, and sometimes you need to get the kids interested in becoming better educated. And some want to do it anyway. Sure. But uh, I've always enjoyed talking to you about that, too. Same here. Yeah, we can circle back to that, and it, it's really, it comes down to that one thing that Mr. Kennedy said, and you've mentioned it before, and you, you said a part of it just a moment ago, what can you do? And yeah. it goes back to not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Appreciate you being here, uh, Charles, and we'll talk to you soon, okay? Always a pleasure, Stephen. Nice, have a nice day. Take you, care. You too. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Hey, Dad, how do airplanes fly? What's in this box? Can I touch this? Where does sand come from? Is this tree good for climbing? What happens if I mix these two things together? How are babies made? What does this thing do? Kids are curious about everything, including guns. Talking to them about gun safety in your home is a good first step, but you can do more. Always keep your guns locked, unloaded, and stored separately from ammunition. Storing your guns securely is the best way to prevent family fire, including unintentional shootings. For more information on safe gun storage and ways to keep your family safe, visit endfamilyfire.org. That's endfamilyfire.org. What do we keep in the attic? What's this thing called? Can I ride my bike backwards? Like I said, kids are curious. It's up to us to keep them safe. Brought to you by N Family Fire, Brady, and the Ad Council.